All right, welcome everybody. It's February 15th. This is the ninth meeting, I believe, uh, for the Wharf Project. Uh, got a couple updates today on progress uh, for those of you not following on GitHub and just want, you know, brief TLDR of what's going on. Um, things are starting to come together, which is super exciting. Uh, we've been sharing a lot of uh, like animated GIFs of how things are working in our Slack, and I've been tempted to share it in Telegram. And since it all looks like the DOS version of blockchain, I haven't, but maybe I should anyways. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess to kind of dive into that, uh, there's been a lot of progress on wallet integrations over uh, the past, I would say, about two weeks now. Um, the Anchor integration has started. Um, Daniel on our team is kind of spearheading that right now. Um, it is in the repo. It is this wallet plugin Anchor. It is, I think what's committed is still a little bit behind, but the rough structure is there. There's some comments going on and what going back and forth about it. Uh, the console renderer also now has its own library. I believe Daniel is working on these in tandem, which is why neither of them have commits, is because he's doing it locally right now. Um, but he is going to try to get Anchor signing transactions on the command line, which is also pretty exciting. Um, it was like just earlier this week or late last week that we had somebody talking about the difficulties of publishing a contract and using the web interfaces and the web interfaces exceeding like the size limits they're capable of and um but still wanting to use anchor so we were like well if we had a console integration for anchor you'd be able to you know publish your transaction from the console sign the transaction with anchor and then it you know happens without a graphical user interface so excited to see where that goes um this is out of scope of the milestones um but we want to contain ourselves within what is capable of a console uh environment while we're building all the wallet plugins so we are doing it anyways and uh hopefully it's going to be really rudimentary at the beginning don't expect a whole lot out of it in terms of interactivity or usefulness in the beginning um, just because we are going to get it to a functional state and then kind of just stop on it and uh, potentially re revisit it somewhere in the future and make it, I don't know, maybe a Clio's competitor or some other kind of command line interface wallet that you know you could do things on the command line and then whatever wallet you use would prompt you for that, you know, and maybe there's Kios D integration at some point. But anyways, that's these two are happening in tandem. My focus was on the Wax plugin the, for the Wax Cloud wallet. Uh, it is maybe 90% done. Uh, it is fully functional. There may be some code changes that need to happen. Um, but within our test environment, this web UI renderer, uh, when integrated with the Wax Cloud wallet plugin, it will. It handles both foreground and background processing of requests, which is a cool feature that the Wax Cloud Wallet offers. Um, like upon initial visiting of it, uh, you hit login and it's going to pop up with the Wax Cloud Wallet login. And you can approve that and you'll be logged into the application. And there's also an option on the login in the modal for the Wax Cloud Wallet that says, always log me into this application. Um, and when you check that checkbox within the Wax Cloud Wallet, it kind of whitelists whatever you're logging in with. And then any subsequent logins to that website happen in the background, not as a pop-up window, but as an API call. Um, so that's implemented this kind of dual function of the uh, Wharf plugin here. Um, and the same thing works for transactions now. Like the first time you do a transaction, it's going to pop up a brand new window with the Wax Cloud Wallet that looks like a signing request tells you what you're doing. You can accept it. It'll send the transaction back to the application, in this instance, the Wharf demo. Um, and then there's also a checkbox on that that you can automatically uh, approve transactions like this. The Wax.js SDK had some 
ruling or some rules established already for how this behaves. We've re-implemented all of that in this wallet plugin, um, including their, they have an array of like whitelisted actions. Um, and if we see that you have whitelisted actions, now the plugin here, the wallet plugin, will also fall back to an API call and prevent a pop-up window from happening. Um, in both of these instances, like it's this dual model of pop-up and background call, um, if the background call fails, it falls back to the pop-up. So, you know, maybe Warf has the wrong information and you don't actually, you know, you can't automatically log in or you can't sign in the background. It'll fall back to the pop-up, the Wax Cloud wallet will appear and, you know, give you that interactivity that you need in order to continue. So. What, um, how big is that, since this is the one that's closest to completion, how big is the Wax wallet? The plugin? Yeah, like, I don't know about Minified, but like how big is the, because you would have to, well, I guess this, is, this comes with another question. Um, can you also lazy load these plugins or do they have to be preloaded? I think they have to be preloaded at this point, but I believe they are relatively small. Let me, I'm jumping into the, uh, I just run make on the Wax plugin. Oh, of course, it's throwing some kind of error. <laughs> I won't resolve that right now, but let's see what the the last build I did was in terms of file size. Um, looks like it was about 21K, what, and that is not minified, and I don't even right. believe the comments are stripped out. So we're talking about like six, five to 6K probably. Yeah. Minified. Yeah, pretty um, small. I would still like to see if there's uh, a potential, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's a potential way to make those lazy loadable uh, for the simple yeah. fact that, I mean, there's probably a possibility that an app is going to want to have as many of these as possible. Um, but the user is only ever going to use one. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm going to take a note and look into how we could potentially do that. Yeah, and after you're logged in, like if you're logged in with the Wax Cloud Wallet, for example, or Anchor, or any individual plugin, like you don't need the other ones anymore unless you're going to do a multi account setup. So right. if there was a way to shed that file size, then again, it's probably going to be cached <laughs> or bundled. Um, yeah, th th that for sure. It's just that first load, especially like, um, I guess if, if we look at it like a, you know, like a component from, from a JavaScript framework. Uh, it's the same kind of concept where you're not really loading all of those components until you request that component from mm -hmm. the server. So I'm wondering if it can be done the same way. I just don't, I'm not sure I've ever done that with a library. Yeah. And we're really building this whole thing with the intention of the compilation being done by the target application. Um, so like Unicode, for example, it's a Svelte app. It has its own TypeScript build process. Um, when we've started a branch on Unicode for Wharf integration, and we're expecting that the Unicode build process will do all of the minification, all of the packaging, all of the like tree shaking to get just the parts it wants, um, and as well as like the deduplication. But like, how do we do that even further in an external applications build process is the question. And I, I don't know right now, but definitely something worth looking at. Wait, do you mean that these would come uncompiled? Like you wouldn't be able to install them through NPM? You would. They are just not going to be minified by themselves. Like your the application developer's oh, build I process should be doing that. Right, OK. The I guess the only caveat to that, which we've been wavering back and forth on, is if we're going to distribute them through something like Unpackage, um, you know, where you can just CDN. yeah, you can just like use a script tag to pull in the components you need. Um, if we I do would publish, very much recommend that. Yeah, it, this was like a big problem with EOSJS historically, where it wasn't, uh, or it was one version of it was and it was busted, and then uh, it was hard for anybody who wasn't using 
a real framework to actually develop it. Like if you wanted to create some basic dumb script for a single page HTML JavaScript site, you were shit out of luck. You had to go and pull it down and build it yourself. Yeah. The biggest problem, like those bundles get so big. Um, yeah. Just because we need to include like the big number support and all like the cryptography and like, so yeah, we can definitely look into including that again. We do that with Anchor Link. Uh, it's just the bundle ends up and it's like 300K minified. It's big. Right. Yeah. I think I think it's hard, right? Because yeah. if you start off with your simplest use case, like I'm just getting started, sure, you would want less stuff and you can strip out a whole bunch of things. But then every time you want something new, like you're going to have to pull in that next library again. And, and so it's really uh, like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like this developer progression, like what's right at the beginning isn't necessarily right as you're more, and a more advanced user. And yeah. we're trying to... We should try to do this once, not not have this uh, progression for progression with feature sets. That would be too confusing. Every time you need this new feature set, you know, fulfill this dependency, check this box, add this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and it's a hard line to walk because you know we want adoption, and if people are willing to sacrifice uh, bandwidth essentially for ease of development because you know like if you go into the uh well, yeah, i can just show you um into the test folder for the web ui renderer when you run the build script it actually bundles everything into one giant js file this bundle js and that's how this script runs and you can see like we have the bundler set up for you to be able to pull everything out of this single package like you can see the anchor plugins there the wax plugins there um and ideally, if we distribute it like that in the future, it would be this would be one script for like the core of WarfKit, and then there would be one for the anchor plugin, and one for the private key, one for Wax. Um, so we could do it that way, and then it'd be up to developers to pick and choose which script tags they include. But even at that point, like this one bundle, like I guess here I can look up how big that is real quick. Test public. <laughs> Uncompiled, it is 1.1 megabytes right now, or uncompressed. So yeah, I expect three, 400K on the complete bundled unpackaged build for HTML. Bundled, you mean also minified? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Let's learn. This is, this is for the UI, or is this for the entire um the entire core the entire core of what you need to interact with the chain it's like the ecc the big number support eosio core the wharf like in totality um all of what's the, the biggest defender there the uh, elliptics yes elliptic is by far one of the biggest i think it's because it doesn't tree shake at all um mm -hmm. and then uh, I just was looking at some site that broke down the file size of it. If you look at um, one of the packaging analyzers for EOS IO core, yeah. that's where all the dependencies come from. Um, is it like bundle analyzer where you can just like look something up? Oh, that's the plugin. I know what you're talking about. I don't remember. Yeah, what's either. yeah I don't remember. But it's like those like boxes, the side by side boxes. Yep. Yep. And each box represents the size of the package. It's mostly yeah. the dependencies. Like the libraries themselves are pretty small. And if we could, as a community, uh, come up with a better set of dependencies, that would probably reduce Specific, the file size. Specifically created ones that are only what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So well, it, I guess what would be the biggest ones? Are it's probably elliptic and and bn. Yeah, I would think so. There was, I think I shared one in the Antelope developers chat. Yeah, uh, I, I pulled it up. So elliptic yeah. is 36, 37%. Um, the code itself is 27%. A big number is 24%. Hash JS is 9.5%. And everything else is single percentages or less. So hash, so hash big number. 
Yeah. Hmm. Ask JS 17, 18K. What? What is that? Just for shot 256? Uh, I'm looking. It is a EOS IO core dependency right now. Uh, we use it for ripe MD and SHA-256. Remind me what we're using ripe MD for? It's for the signature format? Uh, it looks like it's used in base uh, 58 encoding. Oh, I see. But it, it, it's it's one of the smaller ones. Like big number would probably be the one that'd be safest to remove because you got big number support in the browser. Yeah. But um, right. But this right. isn't meant to only be running in the browser, right? This is, meant, um, this is possibly also for Node.js. No yeah. yeah. Well, that that's the that's the issue. Like this, we're looking at core. So core is designed to be run everywhere, and it has a lot of exactly. stuff in it to make it safe for older browsers, which which really, you know, ties your hands back to ES5. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. adding those um, shims is a big deal. You could, you know, make a significant difference if you wanted to build a Node-specific version, right? There's a lot you could do, but, I mean, that's... I think that's one of the things that, that, that they really ran into while uh, developing EOSJS is they... You can see it with the fetch and the... Um, what was it called? The uh, how transpires the decoders, the encoders and decoders, mm -hmm. where they really had you inject that yourself because they didn't want to have something which needed support for two, two different platforms, which was both nice and not nice at the same time. Yeah, we actually started looking at that too because um, at, there was a conversation a couple of weeks ago in the Antelope developers chat about this in particular. And then we looked at EOSJS and how it split the signature provider out of the main package. Um, and that right. reduced a lot of the dependencies because you didn't need it. Um, you didn't need the serialization library. It was just like a dumb API client at that point. Um, on the core side, we can't do that because we utilize the serialization super heavily in those API calls. Um, we I think we use the the raw table format by default, and we deserialize upon arrival um, for a lot of API calls, and that is just to reduce the burden on the API nodes themselves, and that creates this extra burden on the file size of the client. So, kind of you know advantages and disadvantages to both approaches in that regard. It's certainly something we could improve upon, though. Who, just devil's advocate here, who does it benefit more to do that? The API nodes or the integrators of, well, I guess there's three. Does it benefit more the API nodes? Does it benefit more the developers who are integrating the library? Or does it, does it uh, benefit more the users who are using it? Yeah. And I think, yeah. go for Sorry, it. Sorry. I was going to say that's a great question, but I would go even deeper and say, what are the workloads that would be driving, right? The smallest package sizes. And I'd have to say, we don't know. I could imagine a scenario where you want to run something on a Raspberry Pi on the edge, something like that, where you'd have more constraints that you're facing. But that's only in my imagination. I don't know what people are actually doing with it. Yeah. And I'm. it's, it's kind of whether you're front loading the access or you're pushing the load onto the regular usage. So like if you consider like get table rows, whether it's raw or not, um, if you're gonna do raw, you need the serializer. So your initial page load is gonna be a little heavier, but then every API request you make is that much lighter because the data is serialized and it's so much smaller and the response times are so much faster for that user. So it's almost like the more usage a client gets, the more it benefits from having everything come to the client, serialized, and then deserialize it on the client. Exactly. Isn't that only true uh, under certain circumstances? Like, let's say a user is, uh, I don't want to say anybody with a bad computer because I don't really think that's, that's a great uh, uh, argument anymore considering bad computers 
really hard to get at this at this point. But let's say somebody who's inevitably going to use this library in like React Native, uh, where the resources are limited to that environment, um, would they? How much might it cost them computationally inside of that React Native environment? to be running that deserialization and serialization. Is that like impactful? Is it significant? I don't believe it is. Um, it's pretty quick. But then again, I'm okay. also on higher end hardware. So I, you know, I don't have that slow machine to see. Well, I, I remember we had this problem with um like there was the Eva guys, uh, and they actually had to create their entire own SDK for uh, mobile because EOSJS was just it would take like one, one. Uh, sorry, not one second. It would take one minute to sign a signature with the uh, with ESJS inside of React Native. Hmm. I, but I don't know if that's still true. It was before I, they added elliptic. I don't know why it would take that long. Honestly, I feel like it. Maybe it's taking that long because they're loading ABIs or something. Like they're doing network requests. I don't think the actual serialization of a transaction should ever take that long, regardless of hardware. I don't think it was the serialization. I think it, it was um, the signing, like the actual uh, cryptographic signing of yeah. the signature, which is taking a long time, if I recall correctly. We used yeah. EOS. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we used EOSJS in our React Native version of Anchor for a little bit, and it didn't take that long. So I don't, I don't know. We, we did, when we switched to core, we definitely gained a lot of performance um, because a lot of the API calls were removed, but I don't ever remember like the signature generation taking that long. So I, there's too many unknowns, I guess, for me to gauge what's happening there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that um, you know maybe we can put some performance uh, benchmarking in. Yeah. Not that it would answer all these questions, but just to see any changes over time and to get some baseline, right, in terms of order of magnitude, seconds versus milliseconds sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, taking a higher level step up, um, you know, what we have, what I have seen in the Antelope dev forums is people asking for support for other mobile um, development environments. So Dart for Android in China. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, React Native is, I don't think anybody really uses it anymore. Uh, Elliptic, or what's the, Electron, sorry, yeah. has taken over quite a bit. And there's quite a few people using, well, I know there's one heavy developer for that of a wallet with EOS IO Core. You can use Electron on mobile now? Uh... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I don't, uh, maybe, I've never seen that. We use both React Native and Electron right now, um, both for Anchor specifically, but I don't know, maybe it is. Tori is another one that's aiming to be cross framework. But yeah, your point about um, Dart, uh, specifically for Flutter, um, I mean, those are gonna be big projects like, Re recreating the core libraries from scratch, essentially. Yeah, I think that the. Sorry, go ahead. The, sorry, the uh, the developers who are really looking to develop in core languages, um, like Flutter, uh, using Dart or using uh, Java or using. Um, uh, Swift or anything like that, they're really focusing on performance or they would be using some kind of wrapper. And for them, probably be much more recommended that they have a, a library, which is standalone, an SDK specifically for that platform, than trying to like turn what JavaScript wharf is into that. There could be another wharf specifically created for those platforms, um, but I don't think it would be the same library. It's just yeah. another implementation of the protocols, right? Yeah. And we have the core ESIO core, which we'll rename at some point. Like that would need to be recreated for something specifically like Dart. We already have written it. Like it's on our GitHub. We have one for Swift. Um, we need one for Java or Kotlin or something probably. 
Uh, there's probably, I think, groups working on it for C-sharp right now, so that way you can get it into like Unity or Unreal or something like that. Um, but like having those core libraries doesn't necessarily, they're not worth, I guess, is kind of the, the point. They're kind of that core library. And then the model that Worf takes, absolutely, we should have um, some sort of client implementation that follows the same paradigms as Worf uh, and then offers that to iOS developers or Kotlin or Dart or C Sharp or whatever it is. Um, I think we wrote that one originally in the blue paper where we started talking about the SDKs. We proposed Worf as being a way to create one of those, specifically in the web context. And then it could serve as a model for the Dart implementation or you know whatever other implementations we need to build for client-side usage. Um, if those applications are interacting with web applications, like there's nothing stopping a wallet written in Dart from interacting with a web application that's running Worf. Like that's kind of what the plugin architecture is for. Um, but if they want to build a Dart or Swift based client that then interacts with a wallet, that's where they need something that is kind of completely out of scope of what's happening here. Yeah, it, it, I was. That was the point I was trying to make. Is we were focused on this sort of one scenario where performance was important, and I was saying, hey, you know, let's look at at the total market and you know where we could make the biggest impact. I think we'd land on TypeScript again for that biggest impact, and then if we wanted to uh, you know make a, a bigger impact, we'd probably want to take a look market wise at what people are using and for their development environments and see you know what how much it would cost to support another one. Like you mentioned, Aaron, that you already have Swift stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, that that's great, but there's also a cost to trying to maintain that. Um, yeah, you know, so you have to balance balance those two. I think the what the focus for Wharf is the right one. Uh, I just don't want to get make it so super specialized. You know, in you know years from now, when it might have been better just to um, help support a new platform. Yeah, another platform. Yeah, I agree. And we definitely need to, we were doing this in the uh, node operators call earlier today, kind of classifying what the kind of the use cases of that software are. Um, and it's almost like we need to do that for the client development world, you know, the clients that are interacting with these analog blockchains. Um, and then each client platform is going to need a core library that's capable of you know, API calls, serialization, the primitive data types that exist on the blockchain. And then there's going to need to be something built on top of it that serves as the interactivity layer. Um, it is the, the thing that lets you perform transactions or maintain a session or uh, optimize how your API call patterns so that way you know you're not constantly calling git ABI to understand what something is. Um, hopefully, Wharf serves as a good role model for all of those when they exist. <laughs> um, I know I certainly couldn't easily pick up one of those languages and run with it in a short amount of time. You know, it's out of the scope of this in particular and outside of my current skill set. Not to say I couldn't learn, but. Um, Hopefully, we can find some developers that know that stuff and can apply it to that realm. Well, yeah, I've done Android, no Dart. Yeah, and I think from an ecosystem priority standpoint, it's like, what is the most widely compatible platform? And I undoubtedly, I think that's web. Like, everything supports the web. Um, but then, like, what's next? I don't know. <laughs> it yeah. could it could be Flutter. It could be something like Flutter, since Flutter works on both iOS or Android. Or it could be something like React Native. But React Native does work with JavaScript. And I guess Flutter might as well. But um, it's like, how do you hit the largest swath of usage?
Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's also a moving target too. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm trying to remember and trace back to how we got here. <laughs> it was about bundle sizes and compatibility and concerns and usage. Yeah, I think we're talking about bundle sizes first, right? Whether yeah. that'd be a hindrance for an on-ramp. Then we went into, okay, maybe bundle sizes aren't that bad, you know, given where we are with resources, compute stuff. Then we went to, okay, well, let's check the box on performance, right? Is performance right. going to be um, something that that people would be bounce off of and not be able to do? And then I then I went and brought up the That's point of like, hey. We should take a look at the total market before we dive too deep into solving some of these edge cases and just double check to making sure that we have the focus that we want longer term. Absolutely. And I do think we may have identified some good future points that we can start shaving off, like some of the dependencies. Um, obviously, we always want these to be as small as possible and as widely as compatible as possible. Um, but I... I think rewriting core to like drop to like optionally include big number support. Like I have no idea what kind of effort that would take. It's not currently in scope, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> what is um what is big number actually doing? Uh it is what's handling everything that's effectively a name in oh, analog. I see. Because those are that's just annoying. all big numbers. So Why is it doing conversions for like uh, upper scope and lower scope for tables and stuff? Yep. Like anything that's a name field, like all of the table indexes, like you mentioned, all of the actual account names, all of the asset names, everything in a permission structure. Um, like, yeah, everything that is name, quote unquote, name related is a big number in the back end. So it's the way that we deal with all that data i see so really but really it only needs uh the 64 stuff it doesn't need everything else from big number uh i believe contracts can use all different sizes of those oh so it's it's not just about name it's about secondary indices that could be of another type like 128 yeah that was or, just one of the biggest examples or checksums and yeah i see gotcha yeah and we also, if you go dig through core, everything that is um, number based also has an entire math library applied to it. Um, like if you are, you can take two asset classes. Assets are, you know, like tokens that like 1.0. or 1.0000 yeah, EOS yeah. Yeah. is an asset. And you can actually do addition, subtraction, multiplication like any type of math operation on an asset because of big number support. We like I leverage see. all that. In the same way that the chain works where like the last uh, bits of it are the symbol and then you're just subtracting that? I believe so, yeah. The, like the internal representation of an asset is a, uh, whatever int type it is for the actual, like a big int type number for the, unit value and then there is a name value for the actual symbol of the token i see i think it's two 64 bits that are squished together and yeah. like makes up 128 total so that's where like i didn't focus as deeply on that side of things so i'm trying to recall from memory <laughs> yeah i don't remember quite either okay yeah, it's pretty heavily intertwined. Um, it wouldn't be just like a, a flipping of a switch to drop big number support, unfortunately. And again, this is this is because of the um, deserialization and the serialization on the client side. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Yep. Yep. And having everything typed in that way. Exactly. It's having everything typed because EOSJS doesn't have all that stuff typed. It's, it's easier for me to pull out. Of Big number support. Yep. It's it's more JavaScript than TypeScript. Exactly. Uh, yeah, they do bit shift operations on serialization, so they make their own, roll their own. Yep. 
and pretty much everything that comes back out or in, like there's there's some loose typing, but it's mostly JavaScript types. It's like, this is a number and this is a string. And that's kind of as deep as it gets. Um, whereas like everything in core is type typed. It is very few things are strings and numbers. They are actually names and assets and checksums and all these like subtypes, these primitives for analog. Mm -hmm. Which adds a lot of cool features for developers, but yeah, it does add that headache of file size. And then elliptic is the other elephant in the room. It's like, I bet you we only use four, five, six calls from elliptic, but the whole library is bundled there because all of their stuff is so inter interdependent on everything else. And I was just reading an article about Lodash the other day and how it's the same way. You think you're, you know, you're including one really cool helper function from Lodash that helps you in your app. But in reality, that one helper function actually uses 36 other helper functions from Lodash. And so you're including 40% of the library, even though you only include one function. So it's that, it's that cascading of dependencies. <laughs> Cool. Uh, that was a good tangent. Did, we, did you guys have any other final or other thoughts on that? They don't have to be final. <laughs> cool. I'll take that as a no. Um, I guess kind of rewinding a little bit. We've got the wallet plugins. I don't think I have a whole lot to add to that besides the fact that we're learning a lot about what the requirements are of wallets as we're building these wallet plugins. Um, the creation of the Wax plugin led to some new chain configuration capabilities of Wharf. Um, I might have touched on this last week, um, but like Wax is a wallet. The Wax Cloud wallet only supports one chain, and so. The plugin itself needs to be able to tell that to Wharf, and during the user interface prompts, needs to understand that if somebody picks the Wax Cloud Wallet, well, you're using Wax. Like that is all you can do. So there have been changes to the session kit to accommodate for that. Um, this has also led into the creation of a prompting engine, which is kind of the start of the UI interaction specification. That is part of milestone four, I believe. Uh, we have, I think, roughly a dozen methods defined so far in the UI interaction between uh, this specification allows for both plugins, and, well, transact plugins and wallet plugins to do things with the user interface. Um, specifically in the Wax uh, example, the Wax plugin needs to be able to um, open and close windows, and it needs to be able to present um, dialogues to the user that indicate that you know, if if the Wax Cloud Wallet tried to open a pop up and then the pop up could not open and the window doesn't exist, then the Wax Cloud Wallet plugin needs to be able to tell Worf the session kit. It's like, hey, we couldn't open a plugin. You should notify the user, and so that way the session kit the UI portion of it can pop up and say, hey, pop-ups are blocked. Like, this doesn't work. Check your browser bar and you know, click that little thing that says allow pop-ups. So that is a new spec like a new feature that is now in the session kit. And on the anchor side, it also we needed the ability to render a QR code and we needed the ability to show a button to the user. So now the um, the anchor plugin has a method that it can call and say, hey, I need you to present a prompt. Um, and it needs to have this text, this title. It needs to show a QR, and it needs to have a button. And then the plugin itself can add listeners to all of those things and respond accordingly to the user interaction. So the, the interactivity portion of all of this is starting to come together based on the work of the wallet plugins that we've been working on. Uh, and it has also led to the creation of storage, the storage adapter for this entire stack. 
Um, that I don't believe is published on GitHub yet, but we have local dev versions. Um, storage is going to be exposed to all plugins through that context that we talked about a couple weeks ago. So, you know, if you are a plugin developer or a wallet developer, you're just going to have access to storage, which will be defined by the application developer. And if they don't want to define it, it automatically defaults to whatever environment they're working in. If it's a browser project, we're going to be using local storage. If it's a Node.js project, it'll probably just be in memory, um, you know, since Node.js processes are long running typically. And if somebody wants to write a storage adapter, because this is just going to be an interface that anybody can extend and build their own, um, they could write one that writes JSON using the file system handlers in Node.js or something. So. There's been a lot of interplay between all of these with the development of the plugins leading and informing the development of the capabilities of the session kit itself. So that's kind of why you see like some of them being updated in tandem. Um, it's like the plugin needed a feature. And so now we're publishing the session kit with that feature along with the plugin that utilizes that feature. And these are all available on NPM all under the UI branch. Um, so it's not, we haven't broken anything for anybody that's actually using the 2.0 or 0.2 release. Um, but the 0.3 release, all of these will be released simultaneously with an 0.3 version that will be then on the latest tag. So complicated <laughs> multi-project deployment that people will be able to expand upon. So yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, essentially where we're at right now. Um, the session kit itself has this long running PR. I think I've referenced it in a couple calls now. Uh, this PR has been running for a month and just constantly is getting updated. Um, oh, I guess the other thing we've started addling, addling? <laughs> adding is error handling. Uh, the Any errors that are generated, any plugins or whether that be transact or wallet, uh, are now surfaced to the user through whatever user interface is defined. So if like you broadcast and it throws an error, uh, that error then gets surfaced up to the user interface. Uh, or if you're using the Wax Cloud Wallet plugin and for whatever reason the plugin itself fails, that error also bubbles up to the user in the front end. Um, it also console logs it and there's also opportunities to catch it. but that is uh, one of the newer things that has come into play. So it's starting to really all come together. Uh, we are pushing on the Anchor plugin right now. Hopefully, that won't be too much longer. We estimated about two weeks for each wallet plugin. Um, the one that is not started that I almost posted a message for was trying to find a good candidate that is still using the protocol from Scatter that we can then use as our benchmark to test for that part of this milestone. Token Pocket, uh, seemingly its newest version does not support any Antelope blockchain. So that is no longer a great candidate for testing. Um, Wombat is kind of in this weird hybrid state where it's using Scatter's old protocol as well as a weird modified version of Anchor's protocol. So that muddies the water a little bit. Um, so if there are any that just sounds like you have one last plugin to make <laughs> potentially potentially and it is a standalone item on the breakdown of the project that if we can't do right now we could skip for now and it's a plugin so we can always build it later so yeah <laughs> I don't think there's any versions of scatter desktop which don't require the APIs that are now closed yeah uh, so if that's the last op and option then i think that probably it's just one less plugin to make i'm not yeah. going to create a new version of scatter so that you can test something <laughs> that no longer works sorry oh come on man <laughs> no i wouldn't ask that um that one might just get blocked i guess for now until we can find a really good way to test that or, you know, do that development where we're where we have a wallet that utilizes it and we can test it. Um, 
I think likely that's going to be one of those things where uh, in the future, if somebody ever figures out that it's not working, that's when you'll find your candidate. True. True. And hopefully it's not people that are on like an old version of Token Pocket. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, yeah, it works for you, but nobody else can install it and get it working. Or maybe at that point in the future, Token Pocket has re-added support, and then it's like, sweet, we can do this now. So I guess raising that as a, you know, we're not sure how we're going to do that at this point because of external dependencies that are even outside of our control. And we're certainly not going to go fix other wallets so we can do this milestone. <laughs> not fix, but you know what I mean? So yeah, um, and I guess since we're talking about milestones, I think I said this last time, um, and it's even reinforced at this point, the next milestone we feel is complete. Uh, I, Adam, I will probably ping you about this, maybe even right after this call. Um, it's, I think, milestone three in the current one. Milestone four is getting, it's well over 50% at this point, and we're starting to meander into milestone five. So things are moving along. Great. Sounds good. I think I heard you talking, but you were super quiet. Oh, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Uh, barely. No, very quiet. Yeah. Having a bit of technical troubles here. I'll look into the, the mic. All right. Something about a mic. <laughs> we, we can uh, connect after the fact, after the call. Um, or if you get your mic working, feel free to just interrupt me. <laughs> so yeah, I will be giving some updates on that side. Uh, we'll see the progress reports kind of updated to reflect that progress. Um, there are the some of the templates, I believe, are out of sync. If we were back looking at some of this, uh, the web UI renderer is out of sync right now. Uh, the UI plugin needs updating. And I think the wallet plugin template, yeah, it's if it's not on the front page, it's uh, it needs to be updated. <laughs> Things are changing very rapidly, and all of the repositories are kind of updating each other. So. We're up to 13 repositories right now and no signs of slowing down. This is going to be a lot of small modular stuff. Um, you'll start to see that stuff tied together once we get to some of those more uh, high level packages, like the web quote unquote package. Um, and like the web package is going to be the thing that, like a developer who doesn't know a whole lot, is going to be able to drop in and it'll have all the default settings. I think it's kind of pre-configured. We'll give you the wallets we think you need. We'll set API endpoints the way we think it's needed. We'll give you the UI like kit stacked on top of the session kit. It'll just be kind of this easy introduction. It's the starter kit that'll get you into the system. And then if you don't like how the starter kit does it for you, well, don't use the starter kit. And you have all these packages that you can build your own starter kit that matches your like business requirements perfectly. So yeah. Yeah. Good. Crazy, crazy stuff. But super exciting. Uh I think I guess on the design front, uh we've been going week after week over designs. And I think tomorrow morning is Maybe one will be kind of reviewing one of the first actual candidates for what the design may look like. Um, I was joking earlier about how, you know, the, the demos and GIFs I show of this right now all look like they're from the 90s because it's just HTML. Um, but we're going to start building the design on top of all of this pretty soon. The design itself is coming together. Um, they're all going to live in this base web UI renderer that's going to be our UI implementation. Um, you can see there's a UI plugin template. If people want to build their own user interfaces, all they got to do is clone this template and build their own user interface however they like it. Um, they can do whatever branding they want, whatever functionality they want. It'll just work with the session kit. But if you don't, this web UI renderer will 
give you the prompts. It'll give you the status messages. It'll do the creation of the DOM and you know all the interactivity that it needs to function. Um, this whole thing is, is about as modular as you can get. You know, you can sw swap pieces out in and out. It's like a big Lego framework. So yeah, hopefully we'll have something pretty to show here in the not too distant future. Um, it's very functional at this point for at least for like the Wax Cloud wallet and partially for Anchor. Um, it's just, it's, it's boring when it's not as flashy and cool as it should be. Like that cool CSS animation that the Web Connect guys did in that new modal. It's all about the, the floating MetaMask head. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have some fun with it. Sure. Um, I played with that thing way too long the first time I saw it. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it, but I, I imagine if I was a developer, I wouldn't use the web UI render stuff. And maybe I was just playing around to get the screen flow. And then as I integrated into my app, and I mean, there's so many different options now. Probably swap out something else. Potentially. I think, the path of, I think that would be the path that most people would take, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people will probably use the web UI renderer because it's going to give the the core components you need, like here's a blockchain selector and here's a wallet selector and the, the bare minimum. And it, you know, it'll be isolated, it'll be styled itself. But you're right, as soon as an application grows to a certain level of maturity, maybe they want it to exist in their own branded flow and they could always break out and do their own. Yeah, I guess what I'm struggling for is trying to separate out my own bias and the way I do things from <laughs> how other people would do things. And I'm a big Tailwind user, so I'm just gonna put the CSS in with that. And usually that means I not, would not be in this te template land, but would be doing it in a different way, Yeah, I assume. Maybe. It, it really depends on how deep you wanna dive into it. If you wanted it to match your you know, aesthetic to the rest of the site, then absolutely, you know, build your own UI renderer. It's not going to be, it's implementing those 12 methods I was talking about, and then yeah. how those 12 methods interact with your user interface. Um, it's going to grow, it'll be more than 12, but. Um, I don't think we've seen much of that historically, though, even on other chains, like the de facto is to just integrate something like Wallet Connect, because that's the easiest path yeah. to finishing your app. We, oh, I see. And we see people doing it with UAL in the Antelope space right now. Like, how many right. apps have you logged into that you see that generic UAL square pop up in the middle of your screen that has those wide buttons for which wallet you want to use? Um, that's kind of the equivalent of what that part is. And then once you're logged in, you know, it's that UI doesn't get in the way unless you're performing a transaction. And it doesn't even have right. to at that point. It's just yeah, yeah. I get that. Yeah. You're in your app from there on out. I see. Um, we cool. we have to run. We have another meeting. That sounds great. This is probably a good point to wrap it up, anyways. So, thank you guys very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks all. Great. The prog continuing progress. We'll talk again soon. <laughs>